Oxford University has produced a long list of famous scientists, but surely one of the greatest is Howard Florey. He's the man who headed an Oxford team of scientists that made penicillin a usable medication and pioneered the era of antibiotics. In this video, Rob Walters, your Oxford guide, explores Florey's origins, then focuses on his life and activities in Oxford. Flory's father, Joseph, was born and raised in Abingdon, a substantial town just 10 kilometres south of Oxford itself. He emigrated to Adelaide in Australia in the late 19th century in the hope that the climate there would cure his wife's tuberculosis. It did not. Sadly, she died and he remarried. In 1898, Howard arrived, the third child of this second wife. He was born in the Adelaide suburb of Malvern, in this house, in Fisher Street, which was later replaced by somewhat more modern bungalows. Joseph was a boot and shoemaker of some repute and became wealthy enough to send his only son to select private schools and to purchase this mansion named Cariga in the nearby area of Mitcham. This is where Flory grew up and his schools were nearby. He first went to Kyr College, later renamed Scotch College, then to St Peter's at the age of 13 years. I visited that green and spacious all-boys school and was delighted to find that the science area is named after Flory. It also boasts a basement display area devoted to his achievements, which itself is overlooked by a brass head and shoulders of Howard. Surely its most famous ex-pupil, while there, he obtained a grant to study medicine at Adelaide University, money much needed in the final year of his degree when his father died virtually bankrupt. Adelaide University's medical school's main lecture theatre is now named after their famous son. Then Oxford called. Florey won a Rhodes Scholarship to study there, using his medical education to obtain free passage to the UK as the ship's doctor. He attended Magdalen College, to my mind the most beautiful of them all. Here's a glimpse of it, but you can see much more in my video dedicated to this magnificent and extensive place. Flory arrived there in January of 1922 and had the great fortune to be taken into the department of the Professor of Physiology, Maudlin's Charles Sherrington. Sherrington was a recognised expert in the working of the central nervous system, having established the crucial role of synapses and much more. Flory became almost a member of this future Nobel Prize winner's family, often visiting their home in North Oxford's Chadlington Road. Flory's specialism at this point was on the subject of blood flow in the brain, and he was awarded a BSc from Oxford, obtaining a first in the examinations of 1924. Sherrington then gave his career a boost by recommending him for a scholarship in experimental pathology, that's the causes and treatment of diseases, in Cambridge of all places. He took the position, but not before experiencing another adventure as ship's doctor, this time with the university's exploration club on its journey to the Arctic. At Cambridge, he joined Gonville and Keyes College in the autumn of 1924, and a year later travelled to the USA, funded by a Rockefeller grant. On his return in October of 1926, he took up a research position in the London Hospital, now the Royal. And it was during his short stay there that he married his sweetheart from Adelaide, Mary Ethel Hater reed known as Ethel. She had just completed her own medical training in Australia. He returned to Cambridge with Ethel in 1927 as a lecturer in special pathology, gaining his PhD there on the physiology of mucus secretion, the stuff that keeps your airways clear. And in 1932, he moved to Sheffield University as professor of pathology. 
There he spent three years revitalizing the department and investigating the antibiotic lysocyme. You have it in your spit. Until Oxford called again. Flory returned to Oxford as Professor of Pathology and a Fellow of Lincoln College in May of 1935, just over a decade after completing his first degree there. His laboratory was on the first floor of the William Dunn School of Pathology, a building located in South Parks Road, a red brick building which at that time was only partly occupied and backed onto the university parks. He lived nearby at number 16 Parks Road, a large university-owned semi-detached house, less than 10 minutes walk across the parks. The two houses were later replaced by a modern building, housing part of the materials department of the university. But the remaining pair next door paints the picture. Their home looked directly out onto the university parks, though the entrance shown here is quite recent. Abandoning his research into lysosyme, he worked together with Ernst Chain to identify a more likely candidate to employ in the battle against the bacteria that so savagely attacked the human body. In an exhaustive literature survey, they concluded that penicillin was the best candidate based on the 1929 paper describing its accidental discovery by Alexander Fleming of St Mary's Hospital, London. Fleming's investigation did not progress because he was unable to isolate the active ingredient of the penicillin mould that he had observed in action. Ten years later, and with minimal financing from the Medical Research Council, Flory formed a team to do just that. In war-torn Britain, the team, including Norman Heatley and others, received further cash from the Rockefeller Foundation and gradually began producing tiny quantities of penicillin and testing its efficacy on mice. The initial experiment was an unqualified success and was followed by many more, and then the cruncher. Would it work on human beings, or would it harm them? In 1942, Flory enlisted the help of the Radcliffe Infirmary, Oxford's main hospital, for help in answering that very question. First, penicillin had to be tested for toxicity, and this fell to an unnamed woman volunteer who was dying, but agreed to become a guinea pig. The injection produced a strong reaction, and as a result, the penicillin had to be refined before its application to a curable patient could be entertained. It was Ethel Flory, in her work on the clinical application of penicillin at the hospital, who identified a suitable subject. Albert Alexander was a 43-year-old policeman. He had been scratched by a rose thorn was then fighting for his life against a murderous bacterial infection. Doctors had already removed his right eye to relieve the pressure causing him so much pain. The injections of precious penicillin caused a near miraculous recovery, but despite recycling the stuff from the poor man's urine, supplies ran out after five days and he died just 10 days after the treatment began. But the penicillin had worked and soon was proven to work effectively by administration to children who needed less of the stuff to fight the deadly bacteria invading their bodies. Unfortunately, despite Heatley and his colleagues' innovative and dedicated work, the stuff could only be produced in tiny quantities. Extracting penicillin could be likened to trying to extract a few granules of instant coffee dissolved in a bathtub full of water, but worse. So, what to do? Britain was piling all its available resources into the fight against Hitler's invading forces. So Flory and Heatley set off on a tortuous journey to the USA to persuade a number of drug companies, including Pfizer, to step up into full production there. And it worked. 
exciting new methods for growing the necessary penicillin mould broth in factory level quantities were designed and implemented, and a new mould found on a discarded cantaloupe increased the yield per batch enormously. By D-Day of June 6, 1944, there was enough penicillin available to treat all of the injuries suffered by British, American and Canadian invading forces. The great work done by Fleming in discovering penicillin and that of Florian Chain in heading the team that brought it into use as a medical treatment were recognised by awarding all three of them the Nobel Prize in Medical Science in 1945. Penicillin was recognised as the cure for so many bacterial diseases from anthrax through wound infections to venereal disease. Flory was showered with the glittering prizes of academia, including fellowships, doctorates and more from around the world. He also proudly accepted what he regarded as the top job in the UK, President of the Royal Society, and did much to move that august body on during his term of office, including the establishment of Swiss new premises in London. In 1965, he was created a life peer and became Baron Flory of Adelaide in the state of South Australia and of Marston in the city of Oxford. Throughout all of this, he always stressed the teamwork that enabled penicillin to become a usable medication. He continued to head the antibiotic team at the Oxford William Dunn School of Pathology until 1962. One of their achievements during this time was the discovery of another important antibiotic, cephalosporin C. On a more personal front, his residence in the Park Road house that he had lived in for over 20 years came to an end. As mentioned previously, it was demolished by the university in 1957 to make room for a new building. Flory had wisely purchased a disused barn in the old Marston suburb of Oxford in anticipation of this, but its conversion to a home was still in progress. Hence he slept in the pull-down bed he had often used in his office and dined at Lincoln College, while Ethel lived with her daughter in Edinburgh. By the time the renovation was complete, Flory did not need it. He had accepted a new job as Provost of the Queen's College, Oxford, in 1962, and this brought with it a large, impressive and serviced lodging in the college grounds. Ethel, who suffered a great deal of ill health, did live at Old Marston. She died in 1966 and is buried in the graveyard of the quaint church of St Nicholas, which was directly opposite their home. She had contributed greatly to the use of penicillin and in writing a series of books on the clinical application of antibiotics. A year after Ethel's death, Flory married Dr Margaret Jennings at the then registry office in St Giles, Oxford. Jennings had been a loyal member of his team since 1936. Howard Florey died at the Provost Lodging on 21st of February 1968, having spent six years as head of the Queen's College. He made his mark there, adding greatly to the College's accommodation by the creation of the very modern Florey Building, just beyond Moulding College on the eastern side of the River Charwell. The current occupant of his old Marston home directed me to the plaque dedicated to the great man in the entrance porch of St Nicholas Church and informed me that since he was an agnostic, this was thought to be the best place for it, neither in nor out. Nevertheless, a memorial service was held there after his death and later a further service was conducted at Westminster Abbey where there is also a celebratory plaque. Surprisingly, the converted barn has no memorial, possibly because Flory spent little time there. But I was told by the owner that Norman Heatley had lived just around the corner. So I explored, and there on the wall of his modest terrace cottage was this plaque. 
I met his daughter there, and she told me that her father was buried in St. Nicholas Church. So I returned to it and found this memorial stone. What a fascinating story the story of penicillin is. But who's the true hero of the tale? There's a chant that goes like this. Without Fleming, no Flory or Chain. Without Flory, no Heatley. Without Heatley, no penicillin. <laughs> but I do believe that Harold Flory played a crucial role in bringing penicillin to the physician's toolbox, and at a very important time in history too. If you haven't subscribed, then please do so, and don't forget to click that notification button or bell. Uh, more coming from Rob's Oxford in the future. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.